Let's discuss some of the most clutch key moments in 40k history and the change in direction they brought about. There are some pretty crazy ones in here, so let's get into it. Before we get cracking, please consider leaving a like and subscribe if you enjoy the content or learn something new. And just be aware we do have a Patreon now. I did this with the aim of enabling me to release content more often and do some different things like stream gaming, lore chats and hobbying with you guys. Of course that means stepping back from my full time work a bit to fit that in. There are a few cool bonuses you gain by joining up, so feel free to give it a look using the link in the description of my videos and see if it's right for you. So firstly, I think a lot of people sleep on the role that the old ones played in the creation of the Immaterium, the mirror hellscape to reality we've all come to either love or loathe. Of course, a lot can be laid at the feet of the old ones, considering they created races such as the Eldari and the Orcs, whose original form was that of the Krork, just to name a couple. They also were responsible for terraforming a lot of planets throughout the Milky Way galaxy, which otherwise would not have been inhabitable. Now, while we're on the subject of races which predate the current setting by hundreds of millions of years, nothing says maniacal leader better than trading your entire species' souls to ravenous Xenos beasts for the chance to one-up your enemies. But that tale has been flogged so many times. You see, not only did Zarek, the Silent King, unwittingly betray his people to the Catan, he also was the individual responsible for beginning the entire war in heaven against the old ones, just because they wouldn't share their trade secret immortality formula with him. I think we can safely say that the old ones were pretty good judges of character, as it turns out. It's easy to look at Sarek and take at face value his remorse for what he did to his people, but bear in mind this tyrant is also the one responsible for a conflict which would end the lives of billions, if not trillions, when he waged war against the old ones, driven ultimately by greed and a want to unite his fractured people against a common enemy. Of the many species involved in this conflict, the majority being created by and fighting under the banner of the old ones, many belong to the Eldari and Krok races. Can you imagine for a moment if the old ones were able to continue their own peaceful colonization of the galaxy and the Krok never devolved into orcs? Assuming no other cataclysm took place which mirrored the threat the Necrontier presented, the old ones very well could have kept the realms of real space and war separate and maintained control over the races they created given how powerful the old ones were. What a different setting that would be. None of this, there is only war stuff. What a shame that'd be. Moving on from that lost opportunity for peace and prosperity, the next major cataclysm for the setting, besides the various dark ages of humanity, is the fall of the Eldari race. Why was this such a slap in the galaxy's face? Because it not only opened up a rent in real space where you could take a stroll, a hazardous stroll mind you, into the warp itself, the tumultuous warp storms that opened up throughout one end of the galaxy to the other very effectively ended humanity's golden age of expansion and technological advancement. Just for a moment though, indulge me, given the topic. Can you imagine the sheer galactic scale of sensual pleasures and brutal violence that must have been taking place to nurture and then birth a malignant god of excess? That's insane. All that breaking of the galaxy thing, and they still call us smelly bloody monkeys. Now, I don't know about you, but I think Erda's little scattering of the Primarchs bears a mention as far as events which shape the current setting. Can you imagine if the Emperor was able to keep all of his sons close, raising them the way he had originally envisioned, and then began his great crusade in earnest? I really don't think it's a stretch to say the entire galaxy could have been under Imperial rule in a matter of centuries, should all Primarchs and their legions have set off from the Sol system simultaneously. Even the Rangdan wouldn't have stood a chance. If you have a different opinion, be sure to let me know in the comments. Not only this, the matter of galactic conquest put aside for a moment, a change in events of this magnitude opens up a lot of what ifs and speculations. Did the upbringing of the Primarchs who would fall to chaos play a major role in their eventual fall? You could definitely say it did regarding Mortarian, Lorgar, Kurz, Angron, and perhaps Fulgrim's cases. Though an argument could be made for the other trader Primarchs whose upbringing was less obviously detrimental to their mental and emotional well-being. Another point is Erda's interference with Neoth's plan also removed the twin Primarchs from his control. We know one was being raised in the palace, but what if they were both brought up by the Emperor? It would have been so cool to see exactly what Omegon and Alpharius were capable of should they have had the proper tutelage of their father and the Sigilite. 
Do you think the civil war would have been avoided altogether if the Primarchs weren't scattered? Let me know. What do you think was the most clutch point in the Horus Heresy that ensured the Loyalists actually stood a chance against the surprise betrayal of fully half the Emperor's legions? I think we can all agree that if Nathaniel Garrow didn't commandeer a certain vessel and take flight to a friendly armada in the shape of Rogel Dawn's Imperial Fists, then the Horus Heresy could have played out very differently. Of course, he had to bear a bit of a beatdown at the hands of the Praetorian, but it was worth it, right? If Dawn wasn't forewarned of Horus' betrayal, it's quite possible that the Soul System's outer defences, not to mention the Imperial Palace itself, wouldn't have had as much time to prepare as they did. Even though the traitor forces would bully their way through eventually, their losses were noteworthy leading up to the siege, meaning every day spent preparing was worth the lives of thousands, if not more. Let me know your thoughts on this, because there was a lot that took place between the flight of the Eisenstein and the beginning of the siege. It could be easy to relate one event to a greater domino effect, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. Now it will surprise absolutely nobody when I say that even all the way back in M32, the High Lords of Terror were utterly corrupt and useless. When orcs threatened every corner of the galaxy with instant transport technology that could transfer numberless hordes of massive orcs even to the skies above Terra itself, and had at their behest artificial moons which could lay waste to entire planets, humanity's leadership quickly fell to infighting, attempts at political outmaneuvering, and ultimately, critical failure. An orc delegate even had the gall to teleport directly into the Imperial Palace and deliver a list of ultimatums and demands from the Beast to the High Lords. And who do you think stood up in this moment of utter despair? Who said enough was enough and cracked it with the High Lords themselves, single-handedly taking the reins of the Imperium? Slaughter did. The very last Imperial Fist Astartes, the lone survivor of Dawn's sons when all others had met their fates at the end of an orc chopper. Slaughter, or Corland, whatever you prefer to call him, his inspirational leadership and out of the box thinking leads to the relocation of a lost Primarch in the form of Vulcan, the original implementation of mixed Astartes chapter spec op units in the form of the very first Death Watch teams used to infiltrate and sabotage orc attack moons, and best of all, I think you guys will love this one, he personally executes the corrupt leader of the Ecclesiarchy before announcing to all he intends to roll out the Imperial Truth once more, denying the Emperor's godhood. Slaughter is a badass. Okay, fun fact, but I'm pretty sure our next candidate for history making madman Ghost Van Dyer actually ends up as an exhibit in Trazen's morbid Museum of Wonder. In the short novel War in the Museum, a bride of the Emperor, the term for the Adeptus Sororitas before they were founded as the Ecclesiarchy's chamber militant, is freed from the stasis Trazen has trapped her and countless others within. As a reward for helping him, Trazen claims he will allow her to again see her lord Ghost Van Dyer. The novel ends with the bride, a look of utter horror on her face, frozen in time as she witnesses the execution of Van Dyer. Pretty chilling, and a great ending to an action-packed story, honestly. On the whole though, Ghost Van Dyer's discovery of the bride's cult did make it possible for these warrior women to later become the chamber militant of the devious, underhanded Ecclesiarchy. Most people are aware that Goge was the head of the Administratum, though he would make his corruption known when usurping power of the Ecclesiarchy as well. Controlling the resources of two of the largest organisations within the Imperium of Man effectively made him de facto Lord. Van Dyer murdered anybody who dared stand up to him. To make things interesting for everybody else in the Imperium, Van Dyer was quite insane. Of course we know his reign of terror was ended with his beheading, though without his discovery of the brides, the Ecclesiarchy would likely not have had a military at all. This is important, because the Ecclesiarchy epitomises the Dark Age, witch hunting, extreme God-fearing mindset which plays a significant role in preventing or ending any kind of logical or scientific based thought or ideal. If the Ecclesiarchy did not have an army of zealous warrior nuns at their behest, their power and reach would be severely reduced compared to its current state. Would this result in a less pious humanity? Quite possibly. Would that be a good thing? 
Probably not, though that's debatable. As we've seen recently, the Emperor seems to be absorbing the belief humanity has in him to power himself and hold back the Dark Pantheon, so perhaps, inadvertently, the Ecclesiarchy's iron grip on humanity's religious belief system is a good thing? I guess we'll need to wait and see what the Emperor's next move is as to whether him having power is a good thing or not, as far as the welfare of mankind is concerned. From simple nose-picking boy to the greatest orc to exist in 8 millennia, call it luck or divine intervention, but Gaskul Thraka's ability to take a bullet to the skull and not only continue to function, but enable him to receive communication from his deities really threw a spanner in the Imperial works. Especially on poor Armageddon, that place just cannot catch a break. He's not had the greatest impact on major events throughout the galaxy per se, but it's pretty safe to say the uniting effect Gaskor has on his entire race has spelt doom for many species and drained many others, especially the Imperium, of vital resources better spent elsewhere. Imagine for me, if you can, a book of such blasphemous, corrupt power that it could enable its wielder to bend reality with a spoken word or bind and control powerful demon hosts. Well, imagine no more. This book is the Necrotook, and it was thankfully wrested from the hands of heretics by Inquisitor Eisenhorn. It may have corrupted him somewhat, alongside the demon host Cherubael he keeps as a companion, but we're still in the process of learning how Eisenhorn's renegade lifestyle is working out for him within the Beckwin novels. That one chaotic tome managed to corrupt an entire advanced Xenos species called the Saruthi, who, using its power, were able to create spaces that existed within different dimensions or instantaneously travel from one place in reality to another. So we're starting to catch up to modern day events in 40k, but we still have a few cracker points. Of course we need to mention the proverbial elephant in the video, and that is the largest change from 8th to 9th edition 40k, and 40k lore in general, the Great Rift, formerly known as the Cicatrix Maledictum. Finally, Abaddon the Despoiler has achieved something of note and managed to destroy the Cadian pylons likely created by the Old Ones eons past, tearing down the barrier between reality and the Immaterium. Without the founding of the Primaris Marines, chapters that were on the brink of collapse such as the Blood Angels, or basically extinct such as the Scythe of the Emperor, would not have the capacity to continue operations in the current era. Likewise, chapters such as the Soul Drinkers have been reinvented raised once more from their extinction to wage war in the Emperor's name. At this point, all we've been told by Call himself is that he has created legions worth of marines for Rebute, and that not since the days of the Emperor have more space marines existed. There is absolutely no way that Rebute Gilliman could have sallied forth from Terra heading up the Indomitus Crusade if he only had the existing firstborn marines available. Of course, hardy Astra Militarum regiments and zealous sisters of battle would still have answered his call, but I think we can all agree that there's no way that even with a Primarch in the lead, these forces would have been enough to hold back the tide of chaos spilling out of the Cicatrix Maledictum. I wonder if Abaddon would have pressed his advantage and made ingress into the Imperium Sanctus if Rebute didn't have the power of an entire new founding of superhuman warriors backing him. Maybe the Avenging Sun's head would adorn the War Master's trophy rack by now, or maybe he'd be creepily stroking it on his throne, like Horus did Ferris Manus' decapitated skull during the heresy. Both are possibilities. Okay, lastly, but very importantly, we have the evolving narrative regarding the Tyranid High Fleet Leviathan invasion via Segmentum Pacificus. The reason this is so drastically important is that tendrils of Leviathan containing millions, if not billions, of organisms have pierced the Imperium's defense a string of fortified planets which are vital to the war effort. These worlds and their defenders are collectively known as the Sanctus Line. Where does this place the Tyranids currently, I hear you ask? A beeline for Terra, towards the greatest beacon of psychic light within the entire galaxy, the Emperor himself. We do have a full length video covering this topic, which summarises the novel Leviathan. I'll link it in the description, but I think a lot of people are sleeping on the ramifications this particular lore development will have moving forward. Okay, remember we do have a Patreon now. Feel free to check out our Patreon page via the link in the description. It shows you what you receive at each level or tier. I'd so love to take the foot off the accelerator at my full-time job to create more content, 
and hang out with you lot doing some hobbying or video gaming together. So if you're feeling up to supporting me through Patreon, there's a link in the description and on our YouTube page. I really appreciate you guys who take the time to like, share, comment or subscribe. This effort by you absolutely encourages the algorithm to share the video with more people. I'd love to grow on YouTube and create a fun, tight-knit community and helping me in that way with the reacts is so great. Until next week, take it easy and have a good one.